morning, everyone, and welcome to Ballard Spar's webinar presentation in New Hazards in Hiring, Criminal Background Checks and Beyond. I'm Patricia Smith, and speaking with me today is my partner, Stephen Suffles. I are both partners here at Ballard, and we both practice uh, exclusively labor and employment law for employers. We're going to be speaking today about various types of background checks and other forms of employee screening. Uh, employers today have an access to a wealth of information on potential applicants. In searching for the most qualified individuals, employers often eliminate applicants based on information they uncover through the application process. Uh, information as um, credit history reports, um, educational backgrounds, criminal arrest or conviction records, for example. In sorting through that wealth of information, employers increasingly are called upon to balance their duty to conduct due diligence background checks on applicants and by hopefully mitigating the risk of negligent hiring suits and the potential risk of damage to fellow employees, customers, and the public against their duty not to discriminate in hiring process. We'll be discussing some of the hazards employers face during the hiring process at the EEOC's most recent guidance on employers' use of arrest and conviction records. I'm also going to be covering the potential discriminatory impact of educational requirements, credit history reports, pre-employment, drug, and alcohol testing. Now, you'll notice that the first line on the first slide indicates that employment background checks have become a hot topic. Um, they're a hot topic um, in two respects. Of course, the information we're going to be presenting today is recent, and so it's a hot topic in that regard. Subsequently, it's a hot topic because it is an extremely controversial topic as well. Some of you will walk away today feeling that the EEOC's initiative on restricting use of criminal records is a very good step for society, that it will enhance employment opportunities for people who have committed crimes in the past and have paid their dues um, and will, in that regard, uh, mitigate recidivism rates. Others of you will walk away, hear the same information, and conclude that the additional scrutiny that the EEOC will bring to bear on employers through use of these records uh, amounts to an affirmative action for felons program. So those are two very divergent views and uh, reason the, the topic is, is a hot one indeed. We'll begin by speaking about criminal background checks. And um, the EEOC recently issued, recently as of April 25, 2012, long anticipated enforcement guidance on the consideration of arrest and conviction records in implement decisions. Now, the EEOC emphasizes guidance that having a criminal record is not a protected status under Title VII does express significant concerns that employer use of criminal background information may result in illegal discrimination against employees and jo job applicants uh, in violation of Title VII. The guidance that we'll be discussing today is available on the EEOC website, and we encourage you to take a look at that. EOC's guidance on the use of criminal background checks 
has as its backdrop the increased, rather significant increase in the number of Americans who have compiled criminal records, um, both arrests and conviction records. EOC cites <clears throat> Department of Justice figures indicating that back in 1991, only 1.8% of adults had ever served time in prison. And that by the year 2000, last year for which these statistics are available, that that percentage had risen to 2.7% with one in every 37 adults. Now, the guidance references national data supporting a conclusion that criminal record exclusions in the employment process have a disparate impact on individuals, particularly upon African Americans and Hispanics on the base of race and national origin. The reason for that, according to the EEOC, is incarceration rates are not evenly distributed throughout the population, and the EEOC cites Department of Justice statistics demonstrating that incarceration rates for uh, certain minority groups are much higher um, than their portion in the general population, uh, higher being two to three times um, uh, presentation in the population. Now, in assessing whether use of a criminal background check is in some way discriminatory, the EOC relies upon its two traditional analytical frameworks for liability under Title VII, uh, one being the disparate treatment analysis and the other being the disparate impact analysis, and goes on to detail how criminal record exclusions may create liability on each of those frameworks. With regard to the disparate treatment analysis, uh, the EOC talks about its traditional analysis of holding employers liable for Title VII violations if plaintiff demonstrates that he was treated differently because of race, national origin, or some other protected basis. The EOC goes on to emphasize that Title VII protects against decisions based on stereotyped thinking with regard to, in particular, uh, race and national origin. This lists several kinds of evidence that may be used to establish disparate treatment with regard to race, national origin, or other protected characteristics and gives a, uh, a list of types of evidence that they will look at, including bias statements, inconsistency in the hiring process, um, employment testing, and statistical evidence. Uh, let's look at an example that the EEOC has given as to how this might count. They to an instance in which two recent college grads one an African American and one white, both applied for a position with a temp to perm agency. Each of the individuals was invited in for a screen interview. He did well, and the employment agency then proceeded to conduct background checks. Background check results revealed that both applicants had pled guilty to possession and distribution of marijuana while they were in high school and neither had had subsequent contact with the criminal justice system. The interviewer referred the white candidate for further processing, commenting that the conviction was a mere youthful indiscretion and probative of the individual's uh, value as a potential employee. Did not refer the African-American applicant for further processing, commenting that the agency cannot risk referring these 
quote, drug dealer types to its customers. So that is a clear example of different treatment based on race. In looking through the EEOC's um, evidentiary analysis, it references both bias statements, inconsistencies in the hiring process, and use of uh, racial uh, based stereotypes. The second analysis is known as the disparate impact analysis. And most of the guidance we're talking about is devoted to a discussion of this type of liability uh, under Title VII. The analysis applies where a neutral employment policy disproportionately screens out a Title VII protected group. And so it is unlawful unless the employer, and the burden will be on the employer, unless the employer can demonstrate that the challenge practice is, quote, job-related and consistent with business necessity. With respect to criminal records, there is Title VII disparate impact liability, where evidence shows that a covered employer's criminal records screening policy or practice disproportionately screens out a Title VII protected group, and the employer is not able to demonstrate that policy or practice is consistent with this necessity. Now, how do we know what the EUC will consider to be a disparate impact? Or, put another way, how do we know what they mean by disproportionately screening out a protected group? EOC's Uniform Guidelines on Employee Selection, that's a separate document, it is available on their website, provides a rule of thumb. The rule is the selection rate of the racial group in question is 80% or more of the selection rate of the group, the highest selection rate, then there is likely no disparate impact. So a way of it, a simple example. If a lawyer has for uh, its, its uh, job openings eight white applicants and three black applicants, hires 48 of the white applicants and hires 12 of the black applicants, the selection rate for the white Applicants is 60 percent. The selection rate for black applicants is 30 percent. Selection rate for black applicants in this EOC example is 50 percent of that for the white applicants. And EOC will include that if the employer is using a criminal record screen, that it may be having a disparate impact on those minority applicants. But this is not the end of the story. Employer must be able to show that even though there's a disparate impact, mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, the employer may be able to show that despite that rule of thumb, data from its own recruit area reveals African American men are not in that area convicted at a disproportionate rate. Or they are able to show that based upon their own applicant data, criminal record screen has not been screened out at American men at a disproportionate rate. Let's assume the EEOC is likely to here, there in fact is a disproportionate impact in this instance. The next question then will be, assuming disproportionate impact, whether the criminal record screen is nonetheless 
job-related and consistent with business necessity. The EEOC gives two examples, um, two scenarios, if you will, in which an employer will consistently be able to meet the job-related and consistent with business necessity task. The first involves validation of the selection criteria in light of the uniform guidelines on employee selective procedures. That's the uh, document I mentioned a few moments ago. However, in this context, um, that document is going to be of little use to employers because, frankly, there is virtually no data, and the EEOC admits this, there is no data that statistically reliably links condition of any particular crime with uh, likely performance in any particular position. As a practical matter, leaves the employer with the second potential sense. That is, where the employer has developed a targeted screen as opposed to a blanket criminal record screen, which focuses upon the nature of the crime, the time elapsed since the conviction or the release from incarceration of the job and also provides an opportunity for an individualized assessment for people excluded by the screen in order to determine whether that policy as applied to that particular applicant is related and consistent with business necessity. So what do we mean, or what does the EEOC mean, when it talks about the Aryan being job-related and consistent with business necessity? Well, it's a fact-based inquiry. The EEOC will be looking to see if the criminal records exclusion policy is necessary to, and, and these are the EEOC's words, say an efficient job performance. The EOC has noted that a policy or practice that requires an automatic across the board exclusion from all employment opportunities because of any criminal conduct is proper because it does not focus on the dangers of particular crimes and risks with regard to particular positions. That type of exclusion, in other words, not focus on whether it's necessary for the safe and efficient performance of the job in question. What the EEOC is looking for employers to do in terms of putting together a targeted screen, and some of you may feel like you need sociology degrees to wade through all this, uh, but the EOC is looking for employers to focus on the nature and the gravity of the offense. So, obviously, uh, an employer will be permitted to look more closely and skeptically at someone convicted of, of murder than at someone who was convicted of petty, a petty shoplifting offense. EOC also wants employers to be looking at the time that has passed the offense. For example, um, an individual who committed a crime and some time two years ago and since had no contact with the criminal justice system uh, will be looked at much differently than someone who committed a crime eight months ago. applicants who are screened out using the targeted type screen that the EEOC is recommending, <coughs> when recommending, the EEOC 
think it's fair they would prefer that no criminal background screen be utilized. But if lawyer is going to utilize one, it needs to be this targeted type screen taking into account the factors that we were, were mentioning. So as to the applicants who are subject to being screened out due to a criminal records exclusion, even a targeted one, the OC strongly recommends that such individuals are then given an independent assessment as to whether the screen should apply to them in their particular circumstances. And that generally means having a conversation with the person in question. Let them know that they are subject to being screened out due to our criminal records report and the company's targeted criminal records exclusion policy. And an opportunity to explain the situation. Um, I had such a situation come up in my own practice recently. Um, the client in question was a healthcare provider. They had um, a nurse a uh, registered nurse, fully credentialed, apply for a position. The position was an RN, a care facility for elderly individuals. So you're talking, of course, about a vulnerable population here. Company, uh, the, the individual is an African-American male. <coughs> He interviewed very well, kind of liked him, giving him a job offer. They made him one contingent upon clearing, among other things, a criminal records background check. Well, to everyone's surprise, came back that he had a conviction for indecent exposure. The company did absolutely the right thing. They came in, they talked to him about it, they got the other side of the story which was that <laughs> was in his last year of college. He was walking back from a rock concert. There were no restrooms in the facility. Therefore, ducked behind a bush to relieve himself, went up by a local cop, charged with and eventually convicted of indecent exposure because he lived in New Jersey the charge was in Virginia. I want to tell his parents about it. And so he just wound up with this on his record. So, far from an individual that seemed to pose a danger to the elderly patients, the care facility resumed its original thinking, which was that this individual would be uh, an excellent employee and um, it was a happy ending. Um, we are somewhat limited in our time today, uh, so I am not going to go through examples in the guidance of what the EEOC considers to be uh, an acceptable screening out by an employer based upon uh, criminal background records and situations in which the EEOC has found or has noted that it would find that the screen and visualized assessment does not meet the um, standard for uh, business necessity. Uh, those examples are in the guidance available on the website, and we would encourage you to, to, to look at that. Now, the EOC has also um, given additional guidance on use of arrest records versus use of conviction records. And in doing so, they have affirmed their long-standing position that use of arrest records has a disproportionate impact upon many minority groups and that they are um, improper 
it's improper to use them in making hiring assessments because they simply are not sufficiently reliable or probative of whatever the underlying conduct in question might be. Um, many arrests don't result in convictions, many arrest records are inaccurate, and the EEOC will always take the position that use of a arrest record as opposed to a conviction record uh, is illegitimate. Less employer is permitted to make an employment decision based upon its analysis of the conduct underlying an arrest as opposed to the arrest itself. I give an example in the guidance of a situation involving an Hispanic elementary school principal who arrested for improper groping of several young girls. Uh, the school district investigated, found his um, position to be not credible, found the testimony of the individual <coughs> girls to be credible, and terminated him. He brought an action, um, he brought a charge before the EEOC disparate impact based upon his status um, as a Hispanic, the EEOC agreed that use of an arrest record would have a disproportionate impact upon him as a Hispanic, but said that the school district was nonetheless well within its right to terminate him based upon their assessment of conduct that underlied the arrest as opposed to the arrest itself. Contrast, the EOC agrees that a record of conviction generally will serve as sufficient evidence that the person engaged in the conduct in question. With regard to conviction records, the EOC is recommending, not requiring, but rending as a best practice, that if an employer is going to ask, about convictions. They refrain from doing so on the job application itself and hold back that inquiry until later in the interviewing process. The EEOC has um, advised or perhaps we could say my to this all, that compliance with a federal law or regulation is a defense to a charge of discrimination under Title VII. For example, seeing out an applicant who, due to a criminal record, is unable to obtain a federal security clearance, a TWIC card, for example, um, would not be unlawful. But Employers cannot rely on state, local laws, or regulations as a defense to Title VII liability. That can, of course, put employers between a rock and a hard place, um, but state and local laws and regulations um, are preempted by Title VII to the extent that there's a conflict. the EOC has issued um, some recommendations for employer best practices, and um, we have included these for you today. Uh, they're recommending that employers identify essential job requirements and circumstances under which jobs are performed. For example, an electrician uh, applicant with a criminal record of some sort. Um, the individual electrician working for an electric company as part of a supervised outdoor crew has much different job duties and is operating under much different circumstances 
than an individual electrician that's going into work in individual homes. The risks posed in the circumstances are much different, and employers are encouraged to look at those sorts of, of issues. Obviously, they also should be looking at what types of offenses may demonstrate fitness for performing certain jobs. Financial crimes, of course, are going to be uh, subject to scrutiny and, and more likely um, be utilized to exclude applicants from positions involving handling money, uh, cards, uh, customers, personal belongings, etc. Other um, practices um, are listed on this slide and the following one. I think they're all fairly self-explanatory, um, but I'd like to conclude with the advice that we give in other contexts as well, and that is you don't have a good reason for asking for the information you don't have the information. If you're asking about a, uh, a particular, if, if you're asking about a criminal conviction, only focus upon the convictions that would lead you to potentially screen out an applicant for the position in question. Okay, I'm going to now turn the presentation over to Steve for further discussion. Thanks, Pat. Uh, first, by way of introduction, uh, allow me to apologize. I've got a cold. Uh, see how that holds up uh, during the next 29 minutes. Uh, number two, you'll see that you have a chat box on your screen. Uh, feel free, if you wish, to enter questions, uh, and we will respond uh, if we can. Uh, by way of overview, Pat emphasized how the importance of this topic given the recency of these developments. Uh, to drive home that point, uh, in February of this year, the EEOC issued a four-year strategic plan. As part of that strategic plan, the EEOC announced that it was going to develop and implement a separate strategic enforcement plan by the end of the month. At that end, uh, just last week on July 18, the EEOC conducted a hearing. Uh, it heard from 30 witnesses, lawyers, law professors, uh, agency representatives, uh, EEOC employees. Uh, two things uh, came out of that hearing that were of importance to this topic. Number one, uh, there was obviously emphasis that the EEOC should continue with its ongoing uh, strategic plan to litigate large class action cases cases involve large groups of claimants with the potential to change an employer or an industry-wide practice. However, for this topic, important is the number of speakers who spoke about the need for the EEOC to address discriminatory barriers to hiring uh, and among the potential priority enforcement areas. With criminal background checks uh, and bias regarding unemployment status as well as other uh, barriers to entry into the workplace uh, being recommended as areas for particular emphasis by the EEOC. First, let me talk about the issue of credit history checks. Uh, SHRM has recently published that 13 percent of organizations conduct credit checks on all job candidates, uh, while another 47 percent consider credit history for select jobs. Um, the EEOC has expressed concern that as a result of the severe economic downturn that began in 2008 and has continued to the present, that many people have damaged credit. Uh, the EEOC is concerned that use of credit histories in hiring decisions, therefore, uh, will have an adverse impact on some protected classes. Uh, for example, the current EEOC chair, Jacqueline Brian, uh, the EEOC public hearing about a year ago, said that, quote, high unemployment has forced an increasing 
increasing number of people to enter or re-enter the job market. As a result, an ever-increasing number of job applicants and workers are being exposed to employment screening tools such as credit checks that could unfairly, emphasize the word unfairly from my perspective, exclude them from job opportunities. Uh, reasons for damaged credit advances by the EEOC or home foreclosures, credit card debt, or bankruptcy. The EEOC has expressed that inquiry into an applicant's current or past assets, liabilities, or credit rating, including bankruptcy or garnishment records, refusal or cancellation of bonding, car ownership, rental or ownership of a house, length of residence at an address, charge accounts, furniture ownership, bank accounts generally should be avoided because they tend to impact more adversely on minorities and females. Exceptions exist if the employer can show that such information is essential to the particular job in question. Of that list, uh, pay attention because I frequently see it on job applications, uh, asking into rental or ownership of a home or length of residence at a prior address. Uh, recently, a spokeswoman for the EEOC said, quote, it is not clear that employers who are relying on credit histories know if someone has never paid a bill for 10 years or if someone was a very responsible bill payer for years until they lost a job, someone in the family had a medical emergency, or they suddenly couldn't make a payment. We don't think it's a good marker for responsibility in employment, close quote. My editorial comment is, this is agency advice without a legal theory. The EEOC has hypothesized that histories could uh, result in a disparate impact on a range of protected groups. Frankly, they list every protected group uh, except majority, majority groups. Number two, the credit histories are a poor prediction of job performance. And then number three, credit reports may be riddled with errors uh, or be incomplete. Uh, that said, obviously, the litigation results are mixed. Uh, there are court decisions that say that credit checks are you know, appropriate for certain positions, especially where the employee handles large amounts of cash. Uh, however, the EEOC has prosecuted employers over this theory. Frequently, the EEOC filed a lawsuit against Kaplan Higher Education Corporation claiming that they engaged in a pattern or practice of unlawful discrimination by refusing to hire a class of black job applicants nationwide based upon credit histories. Kaplan denied the charge, uh, expressing that the background checks are conducted on all potential employees and the checks are part of the screening process for jobs involving financial matters, such as advising students uh, on financial needs. Uh, what should employers think about? Uh, relating to background checks, uh, employers can take steps to minimize their liability and uh, to potential claims of p disparate impact. First, limiting the use of credit histories to positions where the information is actually job related. Obviously, positions where the employees are handling money uh, or have financial responsibility to the organization would show a causal nexus, uh, a credit check for the janitor are probably far less so. Number two, employers are advised to develop clearly defined criteria to evaluate credit reports, such as the number of accounts, the number of delinquent accounts, et cetera. And number three, employers should consider providing applicants with the opportunity to explain the credit report because in many cases the EEOC believes uh, there would be mitigating circumstances. Uh, by way of summary, uh, you can see that employers should be cautious of blanket policies or practices uh, that based upon criminal conviction, bad credit, regardless of the passage of time or the position sought. Employers should be prepared to articulate how this exclusion is business necessity or otherwise required by law. And employers should think about doing that, not just with respect to uh, uh, criminal checks uh, and legal responsibilities, uh, but also uh, by way of just simple practical human resource management. Uh, in this area, one other thing to think about, we call this Pennsylvania considerations, but because so many of the participants on this call are from out of this particular geographic region, regarding all areas of uh, rules regarding, uh, regarding uh, applications for employment, but especially arrest and conviction records, states and cities have been very active in this area. It's called ban the box laws. They don't want to have the box on the application form. 
that says, have you ever been arrested? Have you ever been convicted? Uh, so compliance with EEOC rules will not be enough for especially nationwide employers or regional employers which are operating in a number of different jurisdictions. For example, Pennsylvania uh, has statutes regarding arrest and conviction records. Employers may not inquire into arrests that have not resulted in a conviction or records that have been annulled or expunged. Uh, they can look into these issues only if reasonably related to job classifications. And here's the Pennsylvania local uh, uh, click. Uh, applicant must be informed if the decision to hire is based upon a conviction record. Uh, in the city of Philadelphia, there is a Fair Criminal Records Screening Standards Act. Uh, what is important here is the second bullet point that in the application process and during the first interview, an employer may not inquire at all about or require an applicant to disclose any criminal convictions. In the city of Philadelphia, that can only inquire, uh, only only occur further down uh, the application process. So please be aware of these under the radar state and local uh, laws uh, which apply to this area. Uh, one area that has received recent attention by the EEOC is education requirements. Uh, Within, within the recent past, the EEOC issued guidance in a question and answer fact to address what the agency viewed as confusion regarding an employer's job requirement that applicants have high school diplomas. The EEOC guidance addressed the effect of the ADE, ADA on high school diploma requirement, making it clear that while it is not illegal for employers to require a high school diploma on its face, an employer may have have to allow someone who claims that a disability prevented him or her from obtaining a high school diploma to demonstrate job qualifications in some other manner. Uh, the EEOC advises that looking at work experience in the same or similar jobs, allowing an individual to demonstrate performance of the job's essential functions may be a proxy for actually having a high school diploma in hand. Uh, in the Q&A, the EEOC graciously says that an employer still may choose the best qualified person for the job. Uh, but uh, just to show how far the agency is going in terms of, again, these barriers to entering the market, barriers to hiring, uh, the EEOC issued an informal discussion letter dealing with the issue of whether requiring a master's degree for a high-level director's position in an organization could be discriminatory. Uh, the EEOC warned a facially neutral practice could put an employer into jeopardy for a disparate impact claim. The EEOC noted that an employer could show that a master's degree requirement is job-related and consistent with business necessity by showing that it is, quote, necessary to safe and efficient performance of a high-level job, close quote. Uh, I would raise the question of how a master's degree could ever assist the safe performance of a job, uh, but the EEOC says that uh, relevant considerations should be for the employer to consider how effectively a master's degree could predict job performance. And assuming that the employer could show that the master's degree requirement was job related and consistent with business necessity, the EEOC nevertheless opined that an employer might be liable unless, if there is an alternative available that would equally effectively meet the business objective. Uh, you can see how deep into the weeds the EEOC is prepared to go in this area. Uh, however, predictably, courts are less receptive uh, in this regard. Uh, a very recent case out of the Ninth Circuit, Johnson versus Board of Trustees, uh, there the employer was held not to be required to offer reasonable accommodation to permit or assist the applicant to meet the prerequisites for the job. In that case, a teaching certificate was required. The employee claimed that because of a disability, she had tried and failed to obtain the uh, 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 certificate, uh, but the court said no reasonable accommodation required under those circumstances to meet the minimum required standard by way of licensing.
position. You, however, there are cases uh, that go the other way for current employees who are performing the job effectively, but now an employer imposes uh, some sort of educational requirement. Medical inquiries and drug tests. Obviously, this is an area uh, which has great uh, resonance uh, at the applicant stage for me. Uh, and we have seen under the, AD, under the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, a great deal of advice given to employers over the years on how to deal with medical inquiries and drug tests at the job application stage. Uh, the ADA provides broad-based protection for job applicants and employees who have, or important for this topic, are regarded as having physical or mental impairments that substantially limit one or more major life activities. The ADA generally prohibits covered employers from taking an adverse employment action against a job applicant or employee based upon a known or perceived disability or from failing to make reasonable accommodations uh, for such individuals. So again, remember under the ADA, we're dealing with two separate lines of analysis. Number one, has an adverse employment action been taken against the individual and failing to hire is an adverse employment action with respect to a job applicant and what are an employer's reasonable accommodation obligations. Uh, with respect to the topic of medical inquiries and drug tests, ADA rules differ depending on the status of the individual. Is it an applicant at the pre-offer stage? Is it an applicant at the post-offer for the employment stage where a job offer has been extended contingent on a contingent basis and rules governing current employees. Uh, the ADA prohibits employers from conducting a medical examination or making inquiries of a job applicant as to whether such applicant is an individual with a disability or as to the nature and severity of the disability. With regarding medical examination, uh, the EEOC defines those as a procedure or test that seeks information about the individual's physical or mental impairments or health. Whether test or examination falls within the ADA definition of medical exam depends largely on the content of the test or examination as well as the information that is extracted. Uh, there are a number of procedures or tests that employers may require that the EEOC does not consider to be medical examinations. They include blood or urine tests to determine current illegal drug use, emphasis on the word current, physical agility and physical fitness tests, and polygraph examinations. Now, we're not going to talk about polygraph examinations, but obviously that's an area uh, of, of pre-employment inquiry that contains uh, a long litany of, of rigorous state and federal regulation. Uh, one example that the EEOC gives in a 2000 guidance is agility tests for police officers. Uh, the EEOC said running an obstacle course was job-related and was not viewed as a medical examination. However, to show how deep into the weeds the EEOC gets, they said that if at the end of, a, uh, of an agility test, an uh, employer measures physiological responses, such as heart rate and blood pressure, that would convert the exam into a medical examination. Uh, Physical strength tests always, separate and apart from the ADA, carry with it potential disparate impacts against women. Uh, for decades, the EEOC has looked upon uh, 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 physical strength tests, uh, which may have a disparate impact upon women employees entering the workforce. Uh, and unrelated to the ADA, uh, you as employers need to keep those uh, firmly in your line of sight. Uh, medical uh, inquiries uh, are also trigger ADA issues. Uh, a disability-related inquiry is a question or a series of questions on a job application or as part of a job exam, uh, a job application process, likely to elicit information about a disability. The EA's limitation at the pre-offer stage helps to ensure that the applicant's possible hidden disability is not considered before the employer evaluates the applicant's non-medical qualifications. As I'm sure you in the audience are well aware, uh, after providing uh, a copy of the job description, uh, an employer may ask if an employee can perform the essential functions of the job 
with or without a reasonable accommodation. And remember that qualifications for a job are measured at the time of the employment decision. So job qualification at the application stage is measured right at that time. Time. With respect to substance abusers, the ADA does not protect current illegal drug users. Uh, and all, however, alcoholism, if it's diagnosed as a medical condition, and recovering drug addicts are protected. Employers may inquire about an applicant's current illegal drug use. Uh, they may go as far as to ask about prior casual illegal drug use, although question whether you should do that. Employers, however, may not cross the line into inquiry about past drug addiction, since past addiction is a protected classification. Uh, the ADA does not limit the use, does not limit what an employer may test for the use of illegal drugs, and in fact, the ADA contains a specific exclusion for drug testing for current drug use, illegal drugs, from the definition of medical examination. Uh, however, remember that a test for illegal drug use may also reveal the presence of lawfully used drugs, and if an individual is excluded from a job because the employer erroneously regards him or her as a current illegal drug user, when a drug test reveals the presence of lawfully prescribed drugs, the employer could be exposed to liability. Uh, it's always a good idea as part of uh, a current drug testing standard uh, to ask an individual uh, whether they are currently taking prescription uh, medications. Got a couple questions. We'll get to those in a minute. Uh, remember once again that many states have legislated further restrictions on medical inquiries and drug tests. One area that you need to be very careful about is workers' comp inquiries. Uh, inquiring into a past workers' compensation history uh, uh, may be prohibited by the ADA, uh, since that does obviously inquire into medical information. Uh, the EEOC considers information concerning a job applicant's work injury record to fall within the scope of disability-related questions that are prohibited at the pre-offer stage. Uh, prior to making a bona fide job offer, an employer may not obtain information about the pr job applicant's prior workers' comp claims or occupational injuries from third parties. That is typically regulated in state workers' compensation laws. Also, though, be careful because that type of inquiry leads to regarded as information, depending on what is disclosed. Uh, with the issue of a one question that we dealt with drug or alcohol, Addict is ADA covered, I believe we've touched upon that. Uh, a question is the use of credit history outside of the hiring process, such as post offer, where a position which requires a company credit card but is issued based on an employee based credit history likely subject to scrutiny as well? The answer is generally any issues about credit history pre or post will be looked at. Uh, but remember, you need to have an adverse employment action. So if you do a credit check on a current employee, if their job duties do not change, there will be no adverse employment action. Uh, on the hypothetical pose, uh, whether you can ask for a credit history prior to offering a company-issued credit card, I think that that provides enough of a causal nexus uh, that that could probably justify the inquiry. Uh, one question that we got from the audience is that we're going to talk about social networking uh, at the hiring stage. We do not have a slide about that, uh, but let me address that issue in the few minutes that remain. Uh, this is a topic which in and of itself uh, could require an additional hour, and I think we've done uh, a webinar on this topic uh, previously. More and more employers are using social media by way of background check. Uh, they are looking into an employee's Facebook posting, LinkedIn accounts uh, to lead data. Uh, it is becoming an increasingly controversial area. Once again, this is an area where the states have jumped in uh, with both feet. At this point, more than a dozen states have enacted legislation to ban employers from asking for employee passwords in order for the employer to access the employee's private Facebook accounts. Uh, there has been litigation over this issue, in particular in New Jersey. There was a litigated case in current employees uh, where the employer obtained surreptitiously 
lying information posed as someone else to access an employee's Facebook account where he saw the employees complaining bitterly about management and supervision. The employees were then disciplined. They filed lawsuits in federal court uh, violating, uh, uh, alleging violations of the uh, Stored Communications Act, the federal statute, uh, and they recovered substantial damages against the employer. So uh, there are practical reasons why employers probably do not want to pose as outsiders in order to surreptitiously surf uh, the Facebook and LinkedIn accounts of applicants, but also, as I've now said, in a number of states, regulations have jumped into this area. Uh, one other practical consideration, though, uh, by jumping into an employee's Facebook, an applicant's Facebook account, uh, an employer is going to learn information about them, about their protected status that you are, are not otherwise allowed to have. For example, go on someone's Facebook account. If they've got pictures about a birthday party, you now know how old they are. If they have pictures about a high school or college reunion, you now know their age. If they post photographs, you now know their color, perhaps their national origin. Uh, they may have postings about attending uh, sponsored events. Now you know about religion. These are all topics uh, which you are not allowed to inquire about in the job application process. And if you now have that information, the applicant will be able to argue uh, that the, that information was improperly taken into account in a job uh, uh, decision uh, to deny employment. So I think this is one of those areas briefly where in addition to all of the legal regulation which is currently developing at a breakneck pace, uh, you may as a practical matter wish to stay away, although you can also imagine a uh, wealth of information which is there, although my jaded view as a parent uh, uh, is that I think, it fa I think all that occurs on Facebook is college students posting photographs of themselves drinking in excess. Uh, I mentioned at the start that the importance of this topic is these are recent developments, uh, and I agree. Uh, she also indicated at the start uh, that there is uh, limitations on what you want to know. Uh, I always summarize these in what I call Suffolk's second rule of employment relations, and it is, in the immortal words of those great philosophers and, uh, and seers, uh, Keith Jagger and Mick, Mick, uh, Mick Jagger and Keith Richard, uh, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometime, you just might find you get what you need. In the topic of handling job applications, undertake a studious uh, uh, review of what you really need, not just what you want, and tailor your application processes accordingly. On behalf of Pat Smith and myself, uh, we want to thank you for taking part, uh, time out of your valuable and busy day to spend time with us. Uh, and feel free to submit uh, any uh, uh, questions that you may have to either of us. Uh, our email addresses uh, are posted in the rack of slides. Thank you very much for your time.